start. There you are. Good. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, welcome everyone uh, to another week uh, reading reading through the uh, the per tidyverse documentation. Uh, so this week we'll be going over uh, a little bit of what we didn't. I guess didn't finish or didn't do last week because it's it a little hidden, a few, a few things, uh, the remainder of the map family, and but mostly it's going to be on predicate functionals um, and all the fun functions that are involved there. So let me share my screen. Um, let me know, is, is, is my screen visible now? It should be some um, Quarto slides, some Reveal.js slides. I can see it. Awesome. OK, um, so yeah, today I'm, I'm going to go over, as I said, kind of two bits. The, there are a few functions uh, for doing mapping operations at a certain depth in a nested list, and then the rest are predicate functionals. Um, <clears throat> so for the mapping part, um, it, the idea is just really to uh, kind of do something at a certain depth. Like, so imagine you have a, a nested list a list inside of a list inside of a list, let's say, or some kind of nesting. And you want to perform an operation um, iteratively, not over all elements of the, the list, but over certain elements of the list that sit at a certain depth. Well, good news is there are two ways that you can do that. So you can apply two per functions, one called modify, modify depth. Sorry, this shouldn't be depth, there should be map. So um, you can modify at a certain depth. So um, basically apply the modify function that we saw last week. And then you can do map at a certain depth, which is basically applying the map, um, pers map function at, at a certain depth. So what do we mean by depth? I kind of described it verbally. Um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a visual uh, prop now. Um, so let's imagine, imagine we have a, a, nested, a nested list. So we have First, a list object that contains two lists. So a uh, list object number one, list object number two, and then those list objects in turn contain um, contain lists themselves. Um, right, so this, this inside of list object, list one, level one, you have object level two. And then that has some, some attributes. So from the perspective of of these functions that we're about to discuss, you know, this is this is a, a nested list, and you know, each kind of leaf in, in the nested list has has a certain, or each kind of object in the next nested list has a certain depth to it. And the way to understand the depth is this: so, you know, first you have kind of depth number one. Depth number one would be these two list objects. Depth number two would be, um, or like depth level two would be. Uh, these objects that are inside of depth one, this this list inside of a list, and then likewise this list inside of a list, and then this would be depth three, right? So far, so good. Okay, awesome. So, um, so as I, as I mentioned, you can you can modify or you can map at a certain depth. Um, so let's say that we wanted to to modify modify the contents here. So, um, so here you can see we have this list object. We have at the very bottom level these the leaves down here. We've got you know attribute one is A, attribute two is B. So we have A, B, C, and D. Um, and what we could do is we could basically modify only those elements of the list with this modify function, modify depth. Uh, and it'll look a little something like this. We'll pass to it this X, which is our, our list, specify a depth. So depth number two, which will be handling these things, um, and then some function. So, and you can provide the function in all the usual ways for per. So either as the name of a function as I've done here, or as a, a formula or an anonymous function as we've seen before. So. If we do that, you can see that it basically changes, you know, capitalizes everything that kind of sits at the bottom of our of our list. So we still have our list object intact, a list of lists. Uh, so it contains these two lists, and those lists contain um, these these characteristics. 
Um, you could do something similar with, with map. So the idea here is basically you apply the modify function at a certain depth within your, your list. You do the same with, with map depth. So instead of using the modify, um, um, I guess verb you can call it, you can, you can use map. Um, and so just map, it applies map at those, those levels of depth. So again, the setup that you'll have map depth, you'll pass to it some, some um, vector or, or list, in our case, a list, um, and then modify at certain depth. Um, or rather map at the indicated depth and then have have some function that you'll apply. So here I'm just taking the the length. <clears throat> some, you know, each one of these things because we had attribute one and attribute two is of length, is of length two. Uh, so we'll find length, length two here. Um and here I have to say I'm a little bit on very much intended out of my depth. Um, in that, you know, whereas per gives us these two these two distinct functions, um, modify depth and map depth, I'm at pains to really figure out if they're really different uh, in terms of what they do for us. You know, if, I, if I take this simplistic case, and I think I've, I've tried a few other cases, but I'll just give the simplistic case that we've, we've had before of our, our nested list. Um, if, if I do modify depth, depth two, um, and then have all the strings um, kind of coerce the uppercase, then I get this, this object where I've got, you know, capital A, capital B, capital C, capital D. And if I do map depth, similar setup, passing the same list, same depth, same function, I get, at least from my naive user's perspective, an identical output. And indeed, if, you know, if I kind of pass this to if if I if I store if I stored this uh, you know as I do here like in this object mod and object map, and then I check you know are these two things identical? You can see that R tells me that they're strictly identical, and I'm kind of left wondering. Um, in case you guys have read through the had a chance to look for the documentation, is it, are are they really functionally different? Are you know or I should say like in, maybe not functionally, uh, but in terms of their effect, are they actually are they actually different? Or if they are different, can you think of any cases in which they might yield different results? Um, I don't know, has had, had anyone had a chance to, to look at these um, ahead of time? Um, I can show you kind of here on the, no, sorry, it's in the map family, uh, predicate functionals. Yeah, it's map depth <clears throat> and uh, modify depth. You know, they they they, they utilize the, the example section at the very end. They have different examples, but I, even with these examples, I'm I don't really see too much of a too much of a difference. Uh, I mean, even if with with this example right here, where they have some list that they've constructed that's you know has some different dimensions here. Um, you know, list called A that has foo and bar, and then you know, list B that has baz. Um, so this list. When we do when we do map depth <clears throat> two, and then and then we we have this this anonymous function that basically collapses this this numeric vector and then um, separates elements with the slash, we we get this, and then if we use a very similar operation here, we get strictly equivalent output. I guess the only Okay, you can see, oh, never mind. Sorry, I'm comparing map depth and map here. That's not a helpful comparison. Sorry, in my mind, one of these was modified depth. Um, but, but still, um, kind of in looking through these examples, I don't see anything that really makes them that distinctive. And, and I notice that, you know, in the examples, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no kind of example where they are kind of doing the same thing and then make a point of trying to explain how these two operations are 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 different. Um, Sarah, Shah, have you have either of you used uh, these functions or alternatively do you have any insights about how maybe they're they're different? No, I haven't used them yet, but I just googled it and in the news section of per 
it says that map depth, like modified depth, applies a function at a specified level of a data structure. Mm -hmm. However, it transforms all traverse vectors up to dot depth to bare lists. Oh, okay. I don't know what that means, but there seems to be a difference. Okay. I wonder where the bare list is. Um... Understandably. here so it, it seems to retain the names <clears throat> yeah i mean maybe this is just one for for some homework i guess for for all of us i you know even in the in the documentation they train they, they you know they they distinguish them by here like what what they're doing you know i think the, the distinction is sort of they draw a distinction between the two and, and that you know map depth is using map and modify depth is using modify, but there's not a clear distinction in terms of what what their return values are. If we're, you know what they do differently, I, I'm I'm a little puzzled on that still. Anyway, hopefully hopefully we'll figure it out. Um, and kind of marching, notwithstanding that kind of point of confusion, just kind of marching steadily forward. Um, there's there's one there's one argument so the arguments you find in the functions are kind of as you might expect you have dot x for the list dot f for the um, um, dot f for the uh, function dot depth for the depth at which you want to perform the operation um, and then and then then you have this this other argument dot ragged um, and I, I I can see what the documentation says, but still, it, kind of its utility hasn't really. I don't, really don't quite understand how this would be useful. Um, um, it, it's basically that if you if you if you provide it a value of true, so if you see ragged equals true, then the operation that you're performing at the depth um, will apply to um, I think we'll, we'll apply it to all leaves, even if they're not at that depth. And I think it's actually the depth up to, up to that depth, if I'm not mistaken. Let me look at that documentation again. Um, we'll apply to leaves, even if they're not at depth. Um, so this is one point I didn't look at whether, so not at depth. So I, I guess I could interpret this one of two ways is, Either it's maybe up to that, or guess what it means in one of two ways is either it's up to that depth that it performs the operation, or that it it's kind of like modify tree, where it applies that operation at every level of depth, um, including maybe levels of depth below the target level of depth. Um, I've not worked out what that is. Um, and then if false, it'll throw an error. Um, let's see if we can get. Yeah, anyway, this one kind of eludes me. Um, I'll, I'll need to work out a few more examples. And unfortunately, I didn't have time to really work through this and work out some examples. It, again, kind of same question back to you guys, Sarah and, and Shaw, whether you've worked with this one before. And um, I mean, I guess Anse, you said no, Sarah, since you hadn't worked with these functions before. So certainly not this 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 argument, which I think is unique to to these two functions um yeah i haven't used it as well you haven't used it either okay all right so may, maybe after this today's session i'll see if i can spend some time figuring this out because i i have to say when i was preparing the slides i i feel like i spent more time uh in a certain sense on on, on the these these modify and map depth things but without really for as much to have something to show for it um but i guess spent more time than that for the rest of the predicate functionals because it's I just wasn't quite understanding what it does. Um, and then the, this last piece, which also I, 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 I guess on one level I understand, but on, on another more practical level I don't understand is you have this this argument, you know, is node dot is node, where basically I think what 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 you can do is that um, you can have some function. So so this you'll, you'll pass to some function 
that will determine whether the level of depth that you're targeting contains a node or not. You know, is, is it a node or is it a leaf? Um, and and then and then from there, um, uh, and then from there, it will do something, right? Um, let me see if I can come to this. What's the difference between a node and a leaf? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't think we've gotten a formal definition of this so far. At least I haven't really, um, I haven't seen it, but this is kind of my intuitive, this is what, what I think is true. And I may be very wrong about this is, let's say like, I think that a leaf would be, I think kind of using an, a, a tree analogy that, you know, leaves only grow on kind of the, like they don't grow on the trunk, they don't grow on branches, they grow or like the big branches, they grow on like the small branches that are outer facing. So if you kind of have that analogy in mind, you know, for a list, you may have elements, uh, you know, so if you think of your list as kind of like a tree structure, um, then the leaves will be, I guess, the, 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 the parts where you're actually going to have contents uh, that have attributes. So for example, this, this I would take these would be leaves right here, these attributes one and two, which are you know in this nested list. Whereas this list, this, these top level lists would be would be nodes. Um, so I guess maybe a node would be some list object that doesn't contain the the whose whose elements aren't all aren't lists. I guess is maybe what I would I would think of it as. I I don't know if that's right, but that's kind of what I've what I've thought about so far. Makes sense to me. I mean, and maybe too, Sarah, like maybe maybe there, there's perhaps purposefully no definition for, for it that, I mean, if there's a function, if it's not just like there is a function that can tell like universally what's a node and not a node, not a node, maybe it's left to the end user to kind of define it. So if you're working with some, I'm thinking in my mind of like a JSON file, um, You you might have some some JSON file that that would um, like, let's say you, you know, maybe your nodes there's some characteristics of your nodes maybe they have properties but you know that they have like child like a child object that's embedded within them and so somehow you could you could identify those things in that way where it's don't don't know don't know um, let's actually see is there is node example. Unhelpfully, there's not. Well, that's um, too bad. Yeah. Uh, and let's see. I remember we did modify tree last week. And I remember this discussion came up in the sense that they distinguish between leaves and nodes. And honestly, I didn't read through this bit of documentation very much last week. Uh, OK, so again, node is predicate functional determines whether it's a node. Um, treats simple, simple, okay, simple lists as nodes and everything else as leaves. Um, okay, so probably you'd have to go to this, this vectors package vec is list. Because then what is a simple list? <laughs> What is a non-simple list, a complex list? I, I don't know. Um, let's see if they do is node somewhere. OK, again, nothing. And then the leaf they'll definitely use, I think, because it's saying what operation to perform on the leaves. Um, OK, trend, modify tree. And I guess in, the, in this case, like, so they've got this, this, this list, a list that contains three lists, A, B, and C. A, B, and C have values. So this is a character vector, or actually, sorry, let's start at the beginning here. Yeah, A, B, and C. Uh, a has a character vector with two elements. C contains another list, which has a, um, Length one character, or, or sorry, I just said character, a numeric vector. And then B also has that. 
So then it's, it's when it's modifying the leaves, it's kind of going down this whole tree structure and then making changes to these kind of terminal, terminal points in the tree. Um, so it's adding 100 to, to every element. So one, so two becomes 102, one becomes 101, et cetera. Um, and I guess it, it, it isn't and can't be performing those operations on the intermediary list objects. It's only able to, to work on kind of these, these parts of the, the tree, these, these named, named things that aren't lists. So I'm guessing in terms of nodes, this would, this would be a node. Not the contents of it, but this list would be a node. And this list would be a node, I guess. These are guesses. Um, Thanks for trying, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for, for, for these, I feel like for, for the longest time, I didn't, you know, I learned just enough per to get by. <laughs> and I think a lot of it was, I was really off put by the kind of very abs, unhelpfully, or let's say, very abstract example, abstract yeah. examples in, in, the, in, the, in the documentation. I never could really get a handle. I was like, okay, I, whereas I can kind of see what's going on. It's like, how would I actually use this? I still have those answers. or still have those questions, it seems. Um, cool. Um, yeah, on to predicate functionals where I have a much better handle on things. <laughs> um, uh, so the so predicate predicate functionals are basically uh, they're, they're functions that kind of have a little bit the following following form. Where uh, I'll just maybe show like one predicate functional. Um, so you'll you'll have let's say even detect, you'll have a function and then you'll have, actually that's a poor example. Um, yeah, um, let's see every, you'll have a function and then you'll have this P right here. So it's, there's some predicate, some function that needs to be executed and, and it'll have, it'll basically resolve to a true or false value. And depending on that true or false value, the, the function that it, the, the, the function, um, kind of like the, the the parent function will do will do something, right? Um, so make this, I guess, going from unhelpful abstract to maybe a bit more concrete. The first kind of set of functions you've got detect and detect index, and what these functions aim to do is to determine if in your list. So these take lists and and vectors in your list or vector. Um, is there at least one occurrence of something that you're that you're looking for? Basically, the difference between these two things is detect will return the value of the first matching element, whereas detect index will return the index of the first matching value. So let's uh, kind of see these in action um, while exploring some of their some of their um, uh, arguments. So one argument is dir for direction dot dir. So as you're traversing these vectors or lists, you need to traverse them in some direction. Um, one direction would be kind of forward, uh, I guess, you know, from left to right, let's say, uh, if you've, you know, resolve this to be one, the number, the series of numbers one through 10, you could kind of go moving from one towards 10 until you find something, or you could do the alter, the opposite of working from 10 back to one, right? Um, so this direction argument um, instructs the function which in which direction to traverse the the object uh, as it's looking for something. And so with 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 her uh, or sorry with with detect, um, what you're going to do is you're going to have the dot x arg argument which will um, uh, you know look through a vector and then apply some function and you're going to indicate the direction. So let's let's start with. Uh, a vector of the numbers one through 10, uh, just to make things really simple. And then we'll have some function, uh, basically like the documentation does, is, is even. So we'll determine for each element of our numeric vector, whether that number is 
is an even number or not, just kind of using this, this modulus operator um, and see if there's there's no remainder. Um, uh, so if if you want to go forward through the list, then you would you would say, you know, per detect, pass the vector, pass the function, and the way in which you can pass the function. Here I'm just using the name out of laziness. Um, and then the direction. So I want to go forward from one to ten. Um, and if I do that, then the first even number I find as I work through that 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 uh, that the the elements of the vector from you know one to ten is is the number two. So then that's that's what detect will return. Because remember, detect will return the first value or, or the value of the first element that. Um, uh, where where this function returns a true, right? So in this case, this is the first. The two is the first element of this this numeric vector um, that that is judged to be even, right? Or the is even function returns true. You could do the same thing with with uh, by going the opposite direction. So you can have the same setup, pass it a vector, look for the first. Uh, element of the vector that is even, but have the direction be backwards. So in this case, we're working from 10 to one. And so since 10 is an even number and it's the first element that that is uh, that detect encounters as it traverses the the vector, then 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 that's what detect is going to return 10, right? So that's one one argument is is direction. Um, another argument that you can use is default. Um, so already these functions have a default value. Um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, Shaw. In in the even or is even, do you have some? Do we have some kind of extra options as well? Like uh, dot f is equal to is even, or we can say something else. Oh yeah, so for the dot f part, you can you can pass the function call in the ways in which you'd pass it to most per function. So it could be, okay. you know, the, the okay. uh, what do you call it? The, the formula syntax, the, the name. Um, oh yeah. And then for the options, I, I don't know if this is what you're meaning for, for the options. If it, um, if you yeah, can pass I the am... dots. Yeah. So you can, you can pass the dots, although it seems they don't say it here, but I know elsewhere in the per documentation, they've, um, they have started to say, you know, whereas this is still possible, that there's a preference that you you specify your function calls differently, basically that you okay. not use the dots. But yeah. it, it's it's still it's still possible. It's still possible. Yeah, okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. In this case, in this simplistic case, there are no other arguments to pass to this function, so it kind of is, is it's a, maybe a moot point. But you're you're right. In general, you could pass you could pass the dots um, to 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 your function. Um, Um, so if you wanted to do, uh, so, so, so the, um, so let's imagine that as you're traversing the list, like you anticipate that maybe there's going to be, that you may not find any element of your vector or the, you know, detect may not find any element of your vector or your list that satisfy that where, where your function, um, it returns true. Um, so what then should be the return value? So by default, if you do nothing, like if you don't specify anything in this argument, if you do nothing, <laughs> then there are return, there are default values. So for the detect function, it'll return null. That may not be something you want, right? Because maybe downstream, you're expecting that you're gonna have a number or a character or something, depending on, uh, and null may be an unanticipated value, so that may not be great, but this is the default. And then detect index will return zero, since I guess it's like an index that's, an index value that's not defined for the for the vector, I guess. I guess that's the idea of why that, that number. So these are the defaults, but maybe you would want to return a different default. Here's how you could do so. So I've got this silly example. Let's imagine, sorry, I'm an American, born in the 1980s, so I remember the Wendy's commercials, where's the beef? Uh, so I've got this function, where's the, uh, where's the beef? 
and it simply looks at elements of um, elements uh, or looks at uh, x where x will be a string and then tries to determine whether the string beef is found within that 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 uh, larger string um, and let's imagine I have a, a list of foods right here. I have a salmon burger, bean burger, and turkey burger. Uh, and so if, if, I, if I run detect on that, then um, you know, I pass it the foods, I pass it the function, my new function, where's the beef? Then I get the default value because none of these has beef in, in, in the string, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but if I wanted to do something different, I could have a different default value. So uh, this is the functions default. If I want to provide my own user specified default, I could do so through the dot default argument. Um, same setup here, pass foods to it, Where's the beef function? And now I can set the default is nowhere, right? Because uh, I'm, you know, it's a character, it's a character string because you know if I happen to have found uh, beef in one of in, in some element of of foods, then it would have returned that that the first value found that satisfies that condition. So it'd be a character, uh, and I just have a character here nowhere, right? Uh, so it's not found anywhere. Um, now you may be wondering, like this is all well and good. You find the first case. What about finding multiple matches? Well, this is possible, just not with detect and detect index. Um, so here's here's an example of how you could do that with other functions. I'm kind of patterning patterning this after something you can find in the examples of from from the the function documentation. So let's use my where's the beef function again. Um, only Let's modify it. Where's the burger? So now I'm looking for the word burger um, in my in my in my uh, um, in foods and foods is the same as before: salmon burger, bean burger, turkey burger. Um, and now I want to now what I want to do is I want to return the values of all elements that satisfy kind of my the condition that that I'm I'm, I'm um, I'm setting in where's the beef, or sorry, where's the burger in this case. That burger is found somewhere in the character string. Um, so here I would use another function, which we're going to see momentarily, called keep. Uh, and what it does is it, it, it keeps all elements of the list or the vector that satisfy the predicate, basically where the predicate functional in this case. So it's kind of the equivalent of f, but you see it's dot p since it's a, a predicate. Um, uh, so you think of it as like first run this function and you'll get a, like a vector of trues and falses and then keep those with true is kind of how you can think about it. So now it'll give me all of the values where this condition resolves to true. And it so happens because I have burger in every single element, I get, I get the full vector back. Um, so it's keeping every, every, every value. I could do the same with indices. Um, we didn't really see an example of with detect index previously, but remember that detect index, uh, detect underscore index returns the index of the um, yeah returns the index of the th of the thing. Um, so maybe I want all the indices um, of matching uh, matching elements. So you can do it in a few ways. Like so for, first, let's work kind of like inner in, from inside out. So the first thing I need to do. Uh, First thing I can do is I can I want to figure out where where are the um, which elements of my vector or list satisfy this condition. So I can do per map LGL and I'll get I'll get basically um, uh, a vector of trues and falses um, where I have foods and then I have my function where's the burger uh, and then I can use which um, and then which will give me um, will give me the indices where true appears. Uh, so in that way, I can I can get my, my my indices. So in this case, it's index one, two, and three, since uh, here I've got index one, index two, index three. Uh, here I have a question. Sure. In the default index, it will give us only one index because- Exactly. The detect thing, we were getting only one default. It, it'll be it'll be the first index it'll be the first index oh, okay where where you find a match and then the where you find a match the kind of the starting position and direction 
and which you traverse the object will matter. So if you if by default it it the default is for the direction is forward from left to right, um, but you could specify it to be backwards instead, right? And it'll just return the first index that it finds as it traverses like at, from a starting position, you know, going to a okay, certain so direction. So for multiple index, we do not have an option actually. Yeah, not in not in the detect family of functions. Yeah, for that you have to you have to go and do these these other things. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Which is a little, I don't know, a little strange, yeah, I guess. Yeah, because in indexes can change, so why they are giving only one option? Yeah. It's kind of. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of an interesting choice because I, I feel like um, I could be wrong about this, but I think string R has, so I think you've got, maybe this isn't, this comparison doesn't hold uh, everywhere, but you have for lots of functions, yeah, you have extract and extract all, match, match all, replace, replace all. So they're kind of like these two pairs of functions where you can either, you know, extract the first occurrence or extract all occurrences. Uh, you know, um, kind of find the first matching, find all of the matching. That logic, we don't find that in per, at least with this, at least with, with these functions. I, I thought that was kind of interesting that, you know, there's a, a choice that's been made on string, on string R, but um, there's no, there's no kind of um, direct equivalent in, in per, at least that I've encountered so far. I mean, maybe it's a hard thing to do. I don't know, um, but it's curious that it doesn't exist. Um, yeah, moving on to uh, another set of family of functions. So every sum and none. And I think if you understand, if you've encountered these in base R, hopefully this will make immediate sense. Um, I sort of was kind of reasoning about this is if you, for example, if you have all in base R, if you have all, and then you have a vector of let's say trues and falses, um, then it'll determine whether everything is true, for example, right? Um, and that that works for vectors. Um, every is sort of the equivalent, but for lists um, and vectors too, but for, for, for lists. Uh, so it'll determine if every every element of a list or vector meets a certain condition, um, and you know when that condition is, is resolved, that it evaluates to true. Right? Uh, sum is sort of like any, uh, but for lists, um, where you have to have at least one. I think that's right. Yeah, at least one um, element of your list or vector. Uh, where the the condition you know uh, that that meet that meet a certain condition sorry uh, that meet a certain condition um, and then none I actually don't know is there any equivalent for so I I think in in base R you could say not all um, or no I, I actually it should be not any that would be none um, I'll correct that. Uh, not any. Is there is there an equivalent of none? Like a little wrapper for for vectors that we could say like no elements of the of a vector meet a certain condition. I don't know. I have never used. Okay. I've not used it very much. I've I, used I've used any and all. Um, I I've remember never in the deep life we do we have the same kind of concept as well. You remember the select and any they were there were there the vector functions mm, mm, okay 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 um and so so um these functions i guess are the first ones so far where where we're finding a dot p argument uh it's, it's kind of funny that you have this family of functions, at least they're, they're grouped together in the, the documentation as predicate functionals. And for detect, you have dot f, right? And f is a function, is a function uh, that resolves to true or false. Um, 
but it's dot f. And now finally for, for from this point onward in the list, you're going to find dot p. Dot p is for predicate. Uh, so I guess in this in this kind of in the R jargon, you know, like the language of the predicate means it's basically kind of like a, a, a function that will evaluate the true or false. And then the truth or falsity um, or a particular element of a list or um, a list or a vector will mean that the function has some behavior, that it does something in response to the truth or falsity of, of, uh, of, of that predicate. Uh, function. <clears throat> I mean, in my mind, I kind of think like, you know, first step is you do this thing and then you perform the behavior. Um, so in this in this case, let's to kind of see how these work. Let's let's imagine we have some set of numbers one, two, and four uh, vector of, of numbers one, two, and four. And I'm going to come back to my is even. Um, you use the, reuse the is even function. So here I'm going to see is every number in uh, this this number's vector an even number, and naturally it's false because only one of only only two of them are. Um, and so, in, in essence, like behind the scenes, I think it's kind of evaluating this for us. Okay, so is it even false? Is it even true? Is it even true? And then it's saying it's like, is every element of this true? No. Okay, so false. Um, and you can do the same with sum. Uh, the idea is kind of the same. Is is there basically is there at least one element uh, of this where where this this uh, predicate this function resolves to to true? Um, so it'll look over every element. Uh, this you know this is not even. This is even. And this is even. Okay, at least one is even, so it returns true. And then is none. So is there no element of the list uh, or or a vector that that uh, evaluates to to true in this case? That's not true. Um, another function that's that's kind of similar that, that 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 may seem like by its name very similar. So so far we have every, sum, and none. In common language, this kind of have has ha, have a meaning. And it has element right here. Um, so you might kind of naively think that. Um, that uh, you know, it, it it it's it's going to be sort of an equivalent of 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 sum, right? Um, but it's not quite the case because it does it, it does a different job, uh, and I'll show you what that different job is. So let's imagine we have some list of foods. Whoops, some list of foods. Yeah, let's imagine we have some list of foods. Um, some are vegetables, some are meats. Um, and we still, uh, and we want to see, uh, so here, let, let's, let's use sum and see what sum does. So is, is, there, is there at least one, one of those that's beef, right? And so it's gonna kind of, um, it's gonna see is, is the string beef an element of any of these character, character vectors? And it is, because indeed beef is found here. Um, you might naively think, okay, has element is going to do the same. It's just different syntax where you you, you provide to it an x, um, and then then you're looking for for y to be inside of it, and yet it yields false because instead what what has element does uh, is it expects it's actually you're you're going to provide it yes you're going to provide it an x just as before, but in in, in y you're actually going to provide it like elements of the array, right? So. Here I could say, does the element, this this uh, vector, beef, chicken, turkey, exist anywhere in the object that I'm passing to you? More foods, right? And it does, because that's what we've defined to be meats. So it does something similar in that it looks for looks for looks for this to looks for the occurrence of some some element that we pass to it, but it looks for it in a, in a different way than some. And some and all and none do. It's kind of looking for almost like does this literal object exist um, anywhere in the in the list or or vector? Um, then I've got this one, which uh, okay. Um, 
also I got a little puzzled on, um, or maybe frustrated on. It, it's pretty, it's kind of a little clear what it's trying to do is like, well, let, let's, let's imagine, you know, like the problem I guess is trying to solve is, is the following. Let's imagine that you're traversing a vector looking for stuff. Um, you have a predicate that's going to help you identify the stuff that you're looking for. And you just want to basically print out to the console, what are the things that this predicate function finds as it, you know, as, as, as I'm traversing my, my complex list, let's say. That sounds a lot like our good old friends head and tail for data frames, right? Head and tail. So head would prevent or print the first what is it, five or 20. I forget what the default value is, but the first in, um, observations uh, and then tail would uh, you know give you the last in uh, observations basically so in a certain sense it it works the same way um, or at least purports to work in the same way so if I have let's say this vector uh, you know I want to look at the head of some vector um, and I want to see you know, is it is it positive I just all like I just want to see positive values. So I've got this vector of from 20, from positive 20 to negative 20. Um, you know, is it, um, show me the head, like the first n number of elements where it's positive. Um, and, and it shows me those, but what's interesting is it doesn't show me what I think would be the head exactly. Um, it, it just shows me all the values. Um, and and I, could actually, I could, running a little short on time, but, um, I, I actually changed this to where it was, let's say, a vector of like 1,000 to negative 1,000, and then it shows me all values that satisfy the condition. It's not really head; it's all the values, which I found kind of curious. And then tail does does the does the same same thing. But what's what's kind of interesting here is that um, I would expect if if tail were to work like it does for data frames, I would expect it to show me the last values that satisfy a condition. And here it, it returns nothing. So it's sort of like it's looking at the tail of this and then trying to find within the tail like the positive values. I, I don't know, these, these functions seem like they don't work. At least they don't fit with the way I expect them to work. Um, anyway, so I just want to share like this is what they claim to do. Maybe I'm missing something here, but I, I'm not convinced that they do what they're, they probably undoubtedly do what they're designed to do, but they may not, I don't feel like they quite scratch the itch that they're claiming to scratch because it's, it's, it's not providing the head or the tail. They're just giving me a bunch of values, which is also useful, but anyway. Have you tried putting a positive integer at the end of like your second? integer so you do the 22 Ooh. negative 20 and then put a positive one because to Let's... me it seems like it's going to give you everything that in the beginning of your list is fulfilling the condition until it's not and then it doesn't give you anything anymore mm. um maybe i tried it and i don't remember what the outcome is so let's let's test that one together mm. Come on, VS Code, where do I maximize you? Okay, maybe it's because this is here. Okay, anyway. Okay, so let's do, I'm gonna make this a little bigger. Say twenty to a hundred, what's or a thousand even? Oh, I mean like twenty to negative twenty, and then you add like one in the end, so that you have like the, all of these negative values, but then that one positive value in the end. You know oh, I, mean? I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it doesn't really matter. And then let's see. Yeah. One. Yeah. Um. Oh, I see. So I haven't defined is positive. A piece of my interface is gone in VS Code. Um, it's positive. Yeah. Mm, okay. 
but still, I would ex I would still expect. I don't know. Again, I, again like um, this is kind of a surprising result for me. I would think that it would take like the last n positive ones. At least that's my mental model. Yeah, from like head or tail it makes a lot of sense. Uh, from like how I how it's usually used, right? But I think the the logic here is just a bit different. Yeah, yeah. I think it's maybe just defining like head and tail as like yeah. Uh, in, in a sense, like detect was right, where you have. So it, it it's sort of like give me the first n values that satisfy this condition. Or maybe head while would be, um, give me the first can first in or you know, give me all of the positive values, um, moving forwards, right? Yeah. And then tail would be moving backwards. Um. Anyway, it's it's a bit different than my well, my intuition about what it should be, is. Um. Let me move on to this one. So you've you've got these these other ones that uh, one one of which we've we've seen. So keep, discard, and compact. I think this might is this the last. Uh, okay, almost last. Um. Uh. So. Let's let's start again with some set of numbers one two five. We'll come back to this is even uh, thing, and uh, what what keep will do um, is it'll basically kind of select and like return to you all of the values in your list or array that that where your predicate functional resolves to true. Uh, so if I'm looking for the even elements, it's going to spit back out to me those elements that are even. In this case, it's only one, the number two. So And it gives me the value, right? Uh, and unlike detect, it gives me all such values. Um, so it's sort of like deploy or select in a certain sense, maybe. Um, and discard, whose name I, I feel like isn't that great here, um, does something very similar, it kind of gives you the complement of this. So it selects those elements of your list or array where your predicate functional resolves to false. So in this case, it's going to give me all elements of my uh, array, or not array, vector numbers uh, that, that are not um, positive, or say, are, are not even rather. So one, one and five. In, yeah, so so kind of in essence, it's it's it really kind of is like this. It's like keep where you just your predicate functional is like you negate your predicate function, kind of right. Um, uh, and so in a sense, like I feel like it needs a better name because it doesn't really discard anything. It just selects the opposite kind of, or it selects the complement um, of of keep. Um, I was surprised by that. I was thinking it was going to be more like filter away all of the elements that meet this condition. But anyway, um, or no, actually, that's exactly what it does. Um, OK, never mind. I think I'm wrong. It does, it does do it. Um, and then the last one, which is kind of uh, interesting, um, is is compact. So uh, I guess it anticipates this case where you may have a list or array that contains empty, empty or null values, and it simply removes those um, and returns to you that object without those empty or missing components. So imagine you have this kind of list right here. You know, a equals a, b equals null, c equals uh, um, like a zero length integer um, vector, d equals na, and e equals an empty list. So I want to use compact on this, and the thing it returns to me is a, a and d. So a is non empty, I guess you can say, non empty, non null, as is d, as an, you know, na is a value. Uh, whereas all these others, this is kind of not a value. This is an empty, uh, so this is null. This is an empty integer vector, and this is an empty list. So I guess it goes for the per compactor, and out comes the, only those things that have 
have values. So maybe this might be helpful in a, a data cleaning pipeline with, with pair. Um, and then the last one, which is kind of like, like this, I suppose, is uh, we've got scoped versions of keep and discard. So keep add and discard at, um, where you can, uh, so you can take some list or uh, vector, and then you can have a function you can have a function that determines where um, where you want to keep things or where you want to discard things. So, um, if if you have this list right here, that's a a you know, this weird uh, weird vector a uh, whose elements are named a b cat dog elephant e, um, then maybe you want to keep only those elements um, whose names. So it acts on the names of of uh, of the uh, um, names of the list. Keep only those that are in in the set letters, and we'll 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 get we'll keep those. It's A B E. Um, we do discard, which should give us the complement cat dog elephant. These are not members of the set elements or sorry uh, letters. Um, and then you know with uh, we could, we could do um, something. Uh, so rather than specifying a set that they're a member of, we could also specify instead a function that helps us select the columns to keep and the columns to to um, to discard. So keep keep those columns whose names whose name is uh, three characters long. And so we get cat and dog because those are the only ones that are exactly three characters long. The, the letter ones are too short. The the animal other animal ones are too long. Um, yeah. And that's and that's that. <laughs> um, sorry, that went kind of a bit long. Um, any comments or questions or anything? Let's see, Shah had to leave, and maybe Sarah did too. Sorry, I, I was still I, muted. I no worries, no worries. <laughs> uh, I just thought the last one was quite interesting because you could use that in data frames, right? Instead of like, or to select certain columns. For example, if you want all of the columns that are three letters long for whatever reason, yeah, then you could do that with that. Yep. Yeah, no, I think it'd be kind of, kind of interesting. Like again, if you're working with JSON or some kind of really nested list, if you just wanted mm -hmm. to have certain attributes and you could describe those attributes, uh, you know, like it's it's in this set of names, keep these attributes that are in these set of names and you could kind of just select those things out of your list or array, the, or sorry, list or vector that, that are of interest. Um, yeah. Nice. I think I'm now at, at peace with discard. I don't know. Somehow, when I was looking at it earlier, it didn't fit my intuition. But now, now I now I understand why I was wrong. Anyway, there are a few things in here that are quite interesting. Um, I'm gonna have to like I've been working with JSON uh, a little. Well, I spent a long time since I worked with JSON, but I've got one project where I'm working with this JSON objects, and I may just tinker with some of those data. I don't I don't I don't know that I can immediately use these things, but uh, it'll be interesting to kind of play with JSON because I I feel like that's where you would have very nested lists and you might want to perform operations at some like depth within the list and uh you know maybe operate on the level of names I, all of this stuff seems like it's tailor-made for that those kinds of use cases yeah definitely i think colin fay actually had some blog a while back um i'll see if i can find it and if so share it where, where he was i think working with json and working with per uh, it was kind of a motivation for for, for per. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Cool. Well, Sarah and uh, and Shaw, the, the you had to go. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for for um, putting up with my presentation. <laughs> uh, um, I, I I feel like there's a lot that's at least for me still needs to be resolved, like in terms of uh, this map and modified depth. I feel like I haven't quite gotten that yet. Um, and then I, I, I'm going to have to look at the head, head and tail while. Um, I think your example helped me better understand what it's doing, but still the names 
throw me for a loop because I connect them with just head and tail, um, which to my understanding do something a little different. Yeah, very understandably. Cool. All right. Well, I guess uh, I'll see you all next week. And I guess Jack will probably help us figure out what we're covering next week. Although I would imagine it's going to be uh, what did we have? The um, plucking, I think. <laughs>